we have with us today Mr. Devas Chavla, Chief Hi. Global Officer and Managing Director, Savista RCM. We welcome you, sir. Hi, thanks. Thank you so much for talking to ET Insights today. We hope you're having a great day. Yes, thank you. A high performance culture is the backbone of a profitable organization. Yep. How important do you treat culture here at Savista RCM? See, I think uh, for high performance, there are one or two key ingredients that I feel are extremely important. First and foremost, you need to be proud of what you're doing. You need to have pride in the place that you're working in, right? And then you've got to be happy, right? If you're proud of what you do and you're happy and excited on a day-to-day -day basis, every day you come to work, you will land up becoming a high-performing individual, a high-performing team. Sure. Research has shown that organizations that focus on performance and health are more successful and they deliver better financial results as well as a result of the same. As per a report by McKinsey, research also shows that only about one in four transformation activities achieve long-term success. What is your experience? That, that what I as per you, what are the pillars of a high-performance culture? Yeah. See, I think a few of them. First and foremost, you got to start with clear goals, right? And top to bottom. So my goal could be revenue and a bidder. But for the person at the junior level, that means nothing, right? So the clarity of what each individual, each level is responsible for is extremely important. Like, for example, for an individual level, it'd be I need to do so many you know, things, activities a day, or my turnaround time needs to be so much, and things like those, right? So clarity of goals you know, is extremely important. Then I think exhibiting the right behaviors, right? So creating an environment where you are, uh, you are ensuring that right behaviors are getting the outcomes and not otherwise. And it ties in very well to what I definitely think is, is probably the bedrock, is creating an environment of unbiased cul culture where, where there's no bias in evaluating or rewarding colleagues. Now see, everything gets driven from that. If, if I promote you because I like you, then everybody in the environment knows that I need to suck up to my boss. That's how I get move up and not perform. So creating that unbiased environment, you know, where you make sure that you're rewarding and, you know, promoting people bases their performance. And, you know, uh, and last but not the least, I think just creating systems and processes. Right, that support that. If you don't create the right systems and processes, which means if your evaluation tools do not ensure that these biases are discarded, right? How will you create that culture then? Sure. You know, um, I very much agree with you there that removing any sort of bias and ensuring that the long-term goals of all employees are aligned yep. are key factors to ensure a high-performance culture and employee satisfaction in the longer run as well. Absolutely. Right. A shift in the culture of an organization mm -hmm. takes time. Yep. Right. And a lot of effort and dedication from all involved stakeholders as well. Yep. What has been your experience, you know, with the task of training a leader's vision into tangible action within the scope of expectations from the particular employee? You know, I love this because I think that, you know, I've I worked on this a lot in a few organizations and I've seen some really good results and I'll tell you how I did that. Like, you know, for my first and foremost thing is that you, the leader needs to walk the talk. Whatever culture you want to drive, you got to exhibit that. I'll take an example, okay? In my, one of my previous organizations, my first day at work, I walk in and I, you know, you know, we run a big operation. Like that's what, we are a service industry, we do a lot of operational work, we have a lot of people working together in, one, in the organization. And what I saw was that there was an operational side of it and there was this corporate side of it. So I walk in and I see a door and there's an access card and you walk inside. And so my first question is like, why do you have this? Like, why, like how do then people come? And they said, no, no, this is the corporate side. So my first order was, of business was, I want the door removed before I, end, before I go back home today, right? And 
my office my office environment needs to change in the sense that I had the door opening on the operational floor side of it so that people can walk in as and when. So if, if you want to set up a culture, and for example, for me, honesty, transparency, that trust is extremely important in an organization to be successful, then you've got to walk the talk. You've got to make sure that you are available, you are honest, you are transparent, right, uh, with the organization. Sure. So, you know, uh, leading from the front, you know, is the hallmark of any good leader yep. and you know great to know that you know, you've been walking the yeah, talk yeah. In, this, <laughs> in, this, in this regard you know uh, there has been this nature versus nurture debate yes that's been going on for a while yeah and as an extension of the same what are your thoughts you know on talent transformation with specific regard to driving a high performance team same. right do you think there is a need to, you know, sort of hire high performance employees or do you think present employees can be groomed to reach a level of high performance? See, I'm a firm believer of nurture. I wouldn't deny there could be certain pockets, certain situations where you need to bring in some high performance individuals to kind of be a, as catalysts, right? Let's say sales, right? Sometimes you need that catalyst to come in, but in principle, Overall, as an organization to become high performance, you do not, like you do, it has to be the nurture, right? So you have to go that path of creating that environment where people are successful. And like I said, you know, I don't think anybody gets up in the morning and says, I'm going to be a poor performer today. You know, I just want to suck at my work today. Nobody, nobody gets up in the morning and says this, right? It's creating an environment that helps them succeed, right? And therefore, I feel, you know, it's the culture that you build. It is the processes that you set up. It is, you know, the support and, you know, the support you give them, the skills you give them, the training programs you set up for them, the biased, biasness is removed, you know, creating an unbiased environment where success is rewarded. You know, so, if, so therefore, I feel nurture definitely is, how you can really build a successful high-performing organization. Sure. So, you know, um, like you very rightly said that nobody wants to be a poor performer intentionally. Yeah. Right? And everybody has that drive, that zeal to, accept, yeah. to succeed. Just that the organization should groom them in the right way. Absolutely. To ensure that you bring out the best. Absolutely. Of them. Abs I mean, and, you know, I think that applies to most spectrums across the corporate okay. world. Yeah. Yeah. There is this report, you know, by Deloitte titled Building the Peloton, High Performance Team Building in Future of Work. Mm -hmm. This particular report emphasizes on the importance of something which has come at the forefront of organization culture, which is diversity, equity and inclusion, yeah. DEI. Yeah. Right? And this particular, you know, this concept probably a few years ago was just a fad. But now it's an absolute, it is considered to be an absolute necessity across sectors, across geographies mm. in the entire world, right? What do you think, you know, are some of the important practices and steps that must be taken to ensure that the right set of measures are implemented in the DEI space in your organization and in the general corporate yeah. world as well? Yeah. Look, the truth is, I never thought it was a fad. I think, especially in a country like ours, which has so much diversity, in general, uh, it, to be successful, you got to ha you got to make sure that DEI is taken care of. Now, let, let me explain a little bit uh, because this is very close to my heart. So, diversity for me is not just people coming with different backgrounds or religions, you know. Or for me, it or gender, you know. For me, it is also about the views, the ideas they bring to the table, you know. Uh, just the different styles of working, right? All of that is diversity for me, and. As a leader, I think our, my first key thing is that bring in people who are not like me, right? Who bring in different ideas, right? And that's what we've set up our, our organization in such a way that our leaders, not, not just me, but my leaders below, our job is to make sure that we hire people with different skill sets who are not, I'm not, I don't want to bring in people just like me because then new ideas won't come in, right? We don't want people who are going, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Right? We want people to have ideas, right? So for that, you need to create the first, you need to hire them. So have the 
confidence in yourself to be able to hire them, right? And get challenged by them. They will challenge you as well. So you have to first hire those people and keep those people and hear those people. So that's one part of the whole diversity piece. On And I'll explain to you how I did all of that. But on the equity side, it's not just... For, for me, it's important that you create an environment where it's equal for all, right? Everybody has the opportunity to succeed and grow. So like I said, I was talking about creating an unbiased culture, right? Which is create based on performance, for example, right? Now, therefore, there is a need to create a process where equally everybody has, has the opportunity to learn and grow. So like, for example, we have training programs across the board. So we have separate training manning programs for our junior level associates, then for team leaders, then for managers, because the needs are different. But we, it is for everybody. Everybody can come and take those programs. Everybody can learn from it. And then everybody can perform. Sure. Right? And that's what inclusion is all about as well. And inclusion is not just, uh, not just uh, you know, involving everybody, but involving everybody in your day-to-day, -day, everyday decision-making process. I'll take example. We have, let's say, we have a process called Synergy. What Synergy does is that all team leaders and above, they get together regularly to make sure that they are best practice sharing with each other on what's going on, what's going well, what's not going well, ideas on what to do, ideas on customer feedback, ideas on what processes they are, seeing, they are seeing doing well, not doing well. So all of that comes together and then that gets transformed in processes. So let's say we, everybody comes and says, no, this, you agree, this process that we're following is slow, gives us returns, you know, our tat doesn't improve because of this. What do we do, right? So they will work and brainstorm on that. Then we have a process called Kaizen, which is, and we have a tool, by the way. So there's a tool set up where our junior most level who are working on the front with the clients, they will give, they will put in their feedback and saying, look, this is what we can improve. We make them the project manager. So the lowest member of our, the frontline associate, he will, he or she will become the project manager of that project. It may be small, it may be two days worth of work, or it may be just a process change that needs to be done. But that individual will lead, supported by the team leader and supported by, you know, someone in quality to make sure that process is set. And that's how we are bring, we make sure that everybody is a part of our day-to-day decision-making. Sure. Sure. You know, uh, like you very rightly said that involving all employees at every stage of decision making yeah. is imperative. Yeah. And I think, I think that is what diversity, equity, and inclusion stand for. Yeah. In fact, you know, we believe um, at the Indian Leadership Council that DEI essentially meet, means bringing 100% of yourself to work every day yeah, without, without any apprehension. Nice way to say that. Without any yeah. hesitations. Yeah. Right? Uh, so lastly, you know, I'd just like to ask you, you know, uh, culture is evolving. Yeah. Organization culture is evolving even faster, especially post COVID. Yeah. What are some of the opportunities that you see, you know, uh, for organizations to tap into to ensure a better work culture for all employees? See, I think Gen Z coming in is changing the environment dramatically, right? Uh, this younger population, uh, they want the ability to be able to say what they have to say. Right? They want, they have, they've grown up in homes that are a democracy. Right? They have a say in their homes. Right? Parents today are, you know, edu all educated parents, they want their children to have a say and have a mind of their own and speak their mind of their own. Uh, and therefore, bringing that, understanding that part of the whole thing, that it is now a culture where, you know, those days have gone where the boss used to say something and everybody would fall in line and everybody would get stuff done and you didn't care. No, now it is a time where they have those ideas. They want to be heard. They want to be expressed. They want to th try things differently. So we'll have to create an environment where we are able to nurture those kind of individuals. Sure. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Chal. It was an absolute pleasure speaking pleasure. with you. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir.